All right, guys, you ready? So independent events. This is our last probability lesson. I know we just started probability. So um, it's short and sweet, right? So um, we're going to wrap things up with independent events. When an occurrence of one event has no effect on the occurrence of another event, the two events are called independent events. You guessed it. Independent events. Um, determine whether each of the following events are independent. So like it said in the definition, they would be two separate events that have nothing in common. They don't influence the other. So let's just practice your knowledge on independent or dependent. The first example, tossing a coin twice and getting tails each time. Independent or dependent? That would be independent. I'm tossing the coin and it doesn't matter what happened last time. There's not, there's always a chance to get a heads or a tails each time. Independent. Second one, draw a king from a shuffled deck, put the card back, reshuffle the deck and draw a queen. Okay. So big deal here. We did put the card back. So all my chances are still the same. This is independent. The third one, draw an ace from the shuffled deck. Keep the card out. Put it in your pocket. Give it to your best friend. Then reshuffle the deck and draw an ace. So this time we kept the card out. We did not replace it. So now there are less cards in the deck, which means I have less of a chance drawing an ace um, because I took one out. So this is dependent. Anytime you take something away, it becomes dependent of it. Um, the last one, roll a number cube twice, get an odd the first roll and an even on the second roll. It doesn't matter what I roll every time. The die is still the same. The number cube is still the same. So this is independent. All right. Here's your definitions um, for today's lesson. So if two events are independent, then um, you're gonna have probability of A and B happening. If I want those two things to happen together, I'm gonna take each of those probabilities and multiply them together. Anytime you see the word and, put this here, and indicates that you are gonna need to multiply your probabilities together. If you think back to our first probability lesson about the mutually exclusive and overlapping events, we wanted this or that to happen. And on the notes I put, if you see or, we add. If you want and to happen, I want to roll a six and spin a five, whatever. If I want two things to happen together, I multiply those probabilities together. If they are dependent, you're going to do the same thing, except um, when you go to multiply, you're going to take the probability of A. When you go to multiply the second thing after A has already occurred, you're taking into account that you, re you removed a card or you took a marble out of the bag or whatever. Um, so using that idea of the conditional probability, something's already happened. <clears throat> That's the only difference there. So it is going to change your sample space. Your denominator is smaller. We're going to look at some examples here. Number one, a red number cube and a blue number cube are rolled. What's the probability that a blue five and a red even are rolled? Let me use some notation here. I want a blue five and a red even. So have you ever played like a game, like a board game, um, where you can win? You win the pot. All the money, you, you, you know, final hoorah, you win if you roll this, if you roll snake eyes. You know, it's something that's like you need two specific things to happen and you get to win the game. And you get to call Jumanji, right? Um, and think about it. So we would multiply those probabilities together. When you multiply fractions together, they get smaller. Their denominator gets bigger. The overall fraction gets smaller, your chances get smaller. So that's why, that's how I remember if I want two things to happen, I want this and this to happen, I multiply them together because my chances get less because I want those two specific things to happen together. 
So let's go back to this number one. I want a blue five. It said it was just a standard number cube. So there is one five out of six sides of my cube and multiply a red even. So there would be a two, four, and six. Three chances out of six. Multiply across three out of 36 or one twelfth chance. Then you roll a blue five and a red even. Number two, a card is drawn from a deck of 10 cards numbered one through 10, and a number cube is rolled. What's the probability that you draw a 10 and you um, roll a three? So probability of drawing the 10 out of the deck of cards, that's only 10, would be one out of 10 possibilities. And you want to also roll a three. There's one three on your cube, or one out of 60 chance of that happening. Next example, there are four green, six red, and five yellow pencils in a bag. Once a pencil is selected, it is not replaced. Hello, not replaced. We're taking it out. We're giving it to our best friend, throwing it away. I don't know what we're doing with it, but we're losing pencils. Number three, find the probability of a yellow and then a red pencil is selected. So how many yellows? I got five out of, what was my total here? Four plus six plus five is going to give me 15. There's 15 total pencils. And I want to also draw a red, but I took the yellow pencil out and I gave it away. I don't know, whatever. How many reds do I have? Six out of how many total? Hey, there's only 14 pencils now. Hello. All right, so instead of trying to multiply these ginormous numbers, I'm gonna do some simplifying. Five over 15 is a third. Six over 14, I can reduce to three over seven. I can also cross cancel those threes out. Final answer, one seventh chance that I draw a, a yellow pencil and then a red pencil. Number four, find the probability of two yellows a yellow and then another yellow, but remember I'm not replacing them. Yellows, five out of 15 multiply with, how many yellows are there now? I just gave a yellow away. Four out of, huh? 14, um, let's reduce, so this isn't so generous, a third times, and I can reduce four out of 14 to two out of seven. This is much better, two out of 21 chance of drawing a yellow in the yellow. Number five, find the probability that the two green pencils are selected. Green and green. First green, there are four out of 15. And I'm gonna multiply that with another green. I already gave a green away. There's only three out of 14. Let's see, let's use some cross canceling. Three and 15 can re be reduced to one and five. Also the other direction, four and 14, I can simplify to two and a seven. This is a lot easier to multiply now. I've got two across the top over 35. If you wanna use a calculator, you can do that too, but that's a good mental workout. Um, do those faster in your head. Okay, so page two, this is the whole reason I even bring up independent events is you have a state standard that says um, knowing when events are independent. And there are rules, there's um, equations and symbols and things that we can do to see if they are independent. So at the top here, it says sometimes it may not be obvious whether two events are independent. So we can use probability to help us determine that independence. There are two methods to determine if events A and B are independent. Your first method is to test whether the probability of A and B happening, their intersection, taking their intersection, if their intersection probability is equal to the probability of A times probability of B like separate, then they're independent. If those two values are the same, if those are equal, then A and B were independent events. The second way we can test is using conditional probability. If the probability of A given B, 
conditional probability is equal to just the probability of A, then it was independent. So um, take a note there that um, it's not equal to the given, it's equal to the numerator. It's equal to just the probability of A. Um, meaning my given population, where I said, hey, everybody that has a master's degree, come over here and then raise your hand if your age is, that doesn't matter. Just the probability of them in the whole group, all the adults in the city or whatever it was, is the same probability if I pull and take the conditional. So it had no effect whatsoever. So you got two different rules there that you can use. So you just want to look and see what kind of problems come up on Delta Math. Here are your examples pulled directly from Delta Math. Let's walk through them. Number six, you've got a group of students at a high school that took a standardized test. The number of students who passed or failed is broken down by gender in the table. Determine whether gender and passing are independent by filling in the blanks of a sentence below round to the nearest thousands. Directly copied and pasted from Delta Math, it looks just like this, okay? Some things I'm probably going to need is my totals. So they gave me the table, but they didn't include the, the totals. So let's see, my total passed... 125. My total failed is 102. My total males is 158. Total females is 69. And the grand total of all of my students is 227. That's my total total. Okay. So this statement, this problem, and they switch as you work through Delta Math. So look at what kind of problem you have. This one says we are looking at um, the probability of male, or sorry, we're looking at the probability of female times the probability of fail, completely separate. Um, so we are going to be using this first method where we're looking at they are completely separate and seeing if they're equal to the overlap. Okay. Since female times fail equals blank. So we got to figure that out. Well, the probability of a female, all my females, 69 out of 227, just pulling that from my total out of my grand total, times the probability of my fail, there was 102 total failures out of the entire class, 102 out of 227. Multiply that together and we get 0 0.137, okay? Then go and do the next part, find the probability of female and fail. So looking at this group right here, 65 out of the 227. Just looking at the whole group, the overlap, the intersection of female and fail, 65 out of 227, 286 thousandths. So those two results, the 137 thousandths and the 286 thousandths are not equal. I think the phrase on delta math is unequal. Since they are unequal, then the events are dependent. So there was some influence there, whether you were female and failed or you were just female out of the class and you failed. So there is a discrepancy there. They are dependent events. Let's look at the second example. Number seven, a group of students at a high school took a standardized test. The number of students who passed and failed broken down by gender. So same setup, new table. Let me add my totals over here. So all the students that passed is, all the students that passed is 84. All the students that failed, 21. Total males, 40. Female 65 and grand total students 105. So those are just handy for me to have. This problem, notice we have the statement starts with since the probability of females given passed. So this uses the conditional. So I'm going to use that second method because I'm testing, I'm using a conditional statement. So let's see. Of the females, I'm um, sorry, of the students that passed. So of the students that passed, I'm looking at just this column. Those that were female, 
52. So I have 52 out of 84 total that passed. Plug that in a calculator for your decimal form is 0 0.619. And then the probability of just female out of the entire class. So all my total female 65 out of 105. Change that to a decimal is also 619 thousandths. So since these two results are equal, then the events are independent. This one's easier to explain. So when my values are the same, they're equal, they're independent, it had no influence. It didn't matter if you were a female that passed or you were a female in the entire class. Like they are exactly the same. I didn't, it didn't matter that I pulled all the students that passed over and took just the females. I could look at the whole class of females. Let me also add on here a note if you wanted to test the probability of female, given that they failed, guess what its probability is? It's also 619 thousandths. So it didn't matter. It didn't matter if I pulled all the people that passed, my pro probability of females is the same. If I pull all the, the students that failed, my probability of females is still the same. I take the whole class, my probability of females is the same. So um, these are completely independent. They didn't influence one another. My small groups had the same probability as my entire group. So I hope that makes a little more sense. I think when they are equal, it's easier to understand why these would be independent events. So um, check those out. Those um, questions, you can tell, are set up all the same. It's still a high school class that takes standardized tests and they give you a table. Your table changes from question to question, but then look at these parts. What are they testing? Are they testing separate events getting multiplied together like the female times the fail? Or is it conditional like the female given that they passed? So that's gonna change from question to question. So watch out for that. The last piece, we're still using those rules at the top but this is going back to just that symbolic probability. So just using those rules and seeing if you know what you know. Let's walk through those. They're not as scary as you think, I promise. So this one says, given that A and B are independent, all five of these remaining examples, every statement says they're independent, period. We don't need to test if they're independent. So those rules at the top, the formulas, they're golden. These are independent events. On number eight, it said, Here's probability of A, here's probability of B, find the value of B given A. And then round to the nearest thousandth if necessary. So go up to the top. It said right up here, B, I'm sorry, probability of A, A given B is equal to, what did I say? The numerator, okay? So this one's written a little bit different. It's B given A, is going to be equal to the numerator. If they're independent, it doesn't matter if I pull that small group, right? It's still gonna be the same probability of the entire group, if that helps any. So what do I know? I'm looking for probability of B given A, and they gave me the probability of B, 0 0.74, um, and they're equal. Um, I'm done, 0 0.74, finished. I told you it's not so bad. Um, given A and B are independent, they gave us A, they gave us B. Find the probability of A intersection B. All right, what rules do I have? The top one, the first method where we can test if the probability of A and B is equal to if A and B are multiplied separately, means the same thing as using this intersection symbol. So it would be equal to A times B. This is what I'm looking for, A intersection B, also known as A and B. They gave me 0 0.36 was A, 7 tenths was B, multiply those together and we get 0 0.252 
straight from the calculator. I didn't have to round. If we did need to round, it's to the thousandths, so. Number 10, they're independent. They gave me the probability of A, the probability of A and B, also known as A intersection B, determine the value of probability of B. We know A intersection B, so I'm using the first method, the same one we did on the last problem, is equal to a separate multiplication. How did I know? Well, I'm trying to find B. And they gave me intersections, so there's some clues there. All right, so what do we know? 0 0.216 is the intersection. Probability of A is 3 tenths. I don't know B. Oh, no, what do we do? We're in math. We always solve equations. So to solve this, I would divide both sides by 0 0.3. Use my calculator. And we get 0 0.72 is equal to the probability of B. Straight from the calculator, did not need to round. Number 11, given A and B are independent, they gave us A. They gave us a conditional. Hmm. I can use that conditional rule like we did on number 8. Um, determine the probability of B. So here's what we know about conditionals. The conditional probability is equal to the numerator or B, okay? So what do I know? Um, 0 0.76 is that conditional is equal to B. I'm trying to find B. I'm done. I can't tell you how bad this one threw me for a loop before when I was writing the notes. I was like, how are we going to do this? I don't know. I was stuck. Um, they are equal. So I'm done. 0 0.76 is my answer. The conditional is equal to it, the, the numerator, so the probability would be voila. Last one, number 12, given that A and B are independent, they gave us A, they gave us B, they gave us a conditional. So we know our conditional probability, this one we're looking for A given B, is equal to the numerator. Numerator, right, probability of A. If that's what we're looking for, just like the last problem, it's equal to A. 6600s. Done. So a lot of these are going to be easy. Now, on Delta Math, your practice problems um, that come up are completely random. So you might have easy, 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 or you might have hard, hard, hard. I don't know. So these are going to be mixed in your practice, and you know that. So um, the second page that we just finished, that's really where your Delta Math is. We did have to go over the first page here to lay some groundwork about what are independent events reviewing independent, dependent, that kind of stuff. But um, your practice is based over testing if they're independent based on their probabilities, like we did on number six and number seven, and then using those rules to find probabilities, like we did on eight through 12. So practice those, rewind, refresh, back it up if you need to see it again. Um, it does take a little time to get this under your belt. It takes practice. So let me know if you have questions. If you are confused, just reach out and we can do some problems together. No big deal. I will see y'all in Google Meet. Catch you later.